Okay, so welcome to this next video uh, in the playlist on inflammation and angiogenesis. In this next video, what we're going to do is look at the extrinsic coagulation cascade. So in the previous video, what we did was look at the intrinsic uh, coagulation cascade. Now what we're going to look at is the extrinsic coagulation cascade. And basically, the reason it's called the extrinsic coagulation cascade is that it relies upon um, proteins, uh, well, specifically one protein, that is external or extrinsic of the bloodstream, basically. So the intrinsic coagulation cascade was something that you only required proteins of the blood in order to trigger. So when these coagulation proteins or these clotting factors uh, came into contact with the uh, collagen of the basement membrane of the, um, uh, the capillary that was exposed when you had damage to the endothelium, uh, that caused um, the coagulation cascade. Well, it caused the intrinsic coagulation cascade. What we're going to see now is that the extrinsic coagulation cascade is set off when uh, the clotting factors from within the blood, the coagulation factors um, from within the blood, which are made by the liver, come into contact with another protein that is outside of the blood and is in the membranes of cells in the uh, peripheral tissues, basically. Okay, so uh, let's start off with um, a um, capillary that has completely that has a tear in it. Basically, there's a hole in a capillary. Okay, so uh, let's draw our capillary with a hole in it, and here's the endothelial cell. Uh, this fried egg-like structure where you've got a nucleus, uh, with, with, which is the um, the uh, equivalent of the yolk of the fried egg, and then you've got the uh, sort of periphery of the um, endothelial cell, uh, which is the equivalent of the um, of the um, uh, what's it called, the uh, white bit of the egg, anyway. Okay, right. But this time, in the case of um, intrinsic coagulation cascade, you had a hole in the endothelium, but the basement membrane was still intact. Now, basically, you've got a complete cut, basically. So, um, you have this complete hole in the capillary. Both the basement membrane and the endothelial cells have been cut, basically. Okay, so now what can happen is that the plasma of the blood can leave through this hole and go into the surrounding tissue. Okay, so um, that's the difference between the what triggers the intrinsic coagulation cascade and what trins, uh, triggers the extrinsic coagulation cascade. The intrinsic coagulation cascade was triggered just by a damage to the endothelial cell, but you still had the basement membrane intact, basically. So you didn't have a full hole in the capillary. Now you've got a full hole in the capillary. So, uh, the blood plasma can go into the peripheral tissue, and that means that all of these coagulation factors, which are made in the liver and are in the blood, um, that are inactive at the moment, are going to come into contact with the uh, tissue that is outside of the uh, capillary. So, let's say we have here a somatic cell. So, this is just some general cell. And basically, what this cell has in its membrane is a protein known as tissue factor. So this box here is going to represent the membrane-bound protein, which is tissue factor. And basically, tissue factor has another name. It's also called clotting factor-free, or just factor-free. So either you'll see it referred to as factor-free, or you'll see it referred to as tissue factor. Now, tissue factor is the unusual uh, coagulation factor, because as we've seen in the case of all the others, they have two states, uh, an inactive uh, state and an active state. Tissue factor only has one state. It's always active, basically. The, diff the thing is, it usually doesn't actually do anything, because it's the substrate for the reaction which it catalyzes is not in contact with it. And the substrate for it is basically factor 7. Now, factor 7 
is a coagulation uh, factor which is usually in the blood plasma. So usually if the capillaries are completely sort of, you know, intact and there's no leakage, then factor 7 does not come into contact with tissue factor because factor 7 remains within the uh, within the vascular system and does not come into contact with the tissue factor which is on the somatic cells. However, when you get a cut, the factor 7 comes out of the um, out of this cut and in the capillary uh, wall and goes and is now in contact with the tissue factor in the cell membrane of this somatic cell. And now the tissue factor is always active. It's always capable of catalyzing its reaction. It's just, it, it doesn't usually have its substrate. And what it does is it converts factor 7 into factor 7A. So basically it activates uh, clotting factor 7 or coagulation factor 7. Okay, so now let's have a look at what uh, coagulation factor 7 does. Well, basically, factor 7 is capable of doing the same thing as factor 9 with factor 8 is in the intrinsic coagulation cascade. It's capable of activating factor 10. So here's factor 10. And basically, what's going to happen is that factor uh, 7A is going to activate factor 10 into factor 10A. So factor 10 basically came with factor 7 out of the bloodstream. It's not just uh, f floating around in the extracellular fluid. It's usually in the blood plasma. But when, of course, this cut happened in the capillary wall, it came out and is now in the extracellular fluid with factor 7. So factor 7 is activated to factor 7A, and then factor 7A activates factor 10 to factor 10A. Now, that's the important bit. You now have factor 10A in the vicinity of this cut, basically. Okay, and what factor 10A does is it activates uh, from them, basically. So, um, also coming out of the blood uh, through this hole in the capillary wall is um, prothrombin, which is also called uh, inactive factor 2. So here's prothrombin, or factor 2 is another name for prothrombin. And basically, uh, prothrombin, or factor 2, is converted by uh, factor 10A to thrombin, or you can also call that factor 2A. So this is 2A. Right, so uh, 7 is activated to 7A when it comes into contact with tissue factor. 7A activates factor 10 to 10A. 10A activates prothrombin to thrombin, and now we know what the enzyme thrombin does. Thrombin catalyzes the conversion of um, fibrin, fibrinogen, which is factor 1, so here's fibrinogen, which is factor 1, into fibrin, okay, uh, which is factor 1A. So fibrinogen is now converted into fibrin, uh, which is factor 1A. Okay, and then what can happen is that you can assemble the fibrin into uh, fibrin strands. So fibrin is converted into fibrin strands uh, by the enzyme uh, factor 13A, which was activated when it came into contact with the collagen. Fibrin, um, uh, fibrin strands, that's what I'm trying to put. Okay, and this is converted by factor 13A. Right, so that's the extrinsic coagulation cascade, and again what it's leading to is the formation of fibrin strands. Now I want to um, stress that it's not one or the other in the case of the coagulation cascade. The intrinsic coagulation cascade is activated when um, the clotting factors come into contact with collagen. Now, um, so they are activated if you just damage the endothelium and you then have the basement membrane touching the blood. That activates the intrinsic coagulation cascade. It does not activate the extrinsic coagulation cascade. But if I cut the uh, capillary like this, then I don't want you to go away thinking that just the extrinsic coagulation cascade happens. Yes, the extrinsic coagulation cascade will happen because 7 will come into contact with tissue factor and be converted into 7A, but the intrinsic coagulation cascade will be happening as well because 
basically, the extracellular matrix is a huge great meshwork of collagen. All around these cells is the extracellular matrix, and this is a huge mass of extracellular collagen. So basically, in amongst all of these somatic cells, you have the extracellular matrix, which is made up of mainly collagen. So this is the extracellular matrix. Okay, so when, um, when you get a cut in the side of your capillary like this, all of the coagulation proteins will be coming out into uh, this region, and this collagen of the extracellular matrix will also activate the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So just to emphasize this, I want to re-go over the intrinsic coagulation cascade to show you that if you get a cut in your capillary, which goes through both the basement membrane and the endothelial cells, it will activate both the extrinsic coagulation cascade and the intrinsic coagulation cascade. But if you get a damage to your capillary where you just damage the endothelium and the basement membrane is still intact, then that just activates the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So basically, the extrinsic coagulation cascade is a coagulation cascade that is on top of the intrinsic coagulation cascade. It's accessory to it, if you like. All right. So when, um, when factor 12... Uh, comes into contact with the collagen. So now we're going to have a revision of the intrinsic coagulation cascade. So down here is the intrinsic pathway. I'll put it here. Basically, when um, factor 12 comes out of your capillary through this hole that you've got here, what's going to happen is that factor 12, which here, is going to be activated to factor 12A by the collagen of the extracellular matrix. So it becomes 12A here. Okay, so factor 12 has been activated to factor 12A. And just to remind you that factor 12 has another name. It's also known as Hageman factor. Okay, right. Uh, so Hageman factor is activated to factor 12A. Right, okay. Uh, so next, what happens is that Factor 12A then activates the conversion of um, factor 11 into factor 11A. So factor 11 goes into factor 11A. So again, 11 comes out of this hole in your capillary and is now in the extracellular fluid. So um, it can be converted by the 12A into uh, 11A. Now, what happens uh, with factor 11A? Well, it activates the conversion of factor 9 inactive into factor 9A. So 9 goes to 9A uh, by factor 11A. Okay, and then finally, uh, what happens is that factor 9A along with factor 8A, and it's essential that you have both of them. And remember, factor 8A, like factor 12A, is also activated by exposure to collagen. So the two together are then involved in converting factor 10 into factor 10A. And then we know what factor 10A does. It converts, we'll go over it again, uh, it converts, because it doesn't hurt to repeat things, it converts prothrombin, or uh, factor 2 if you like, into uh, factor 2A, uh, which is thrombin, which is the active enzyme, uh, which is going to convert fibrinogen into fibrin monomers. So this catalyzes the conversion of fibrinogen or factor 1 into uh, the active factor 1, which is also called fibrin. And then the fibrin monomers are assembled into uh, fibrin strands by the enzyme factor 13A, which was also activated by exposure to collagen. So this is uh, fibrin strands. So Overall, those are the two pathways by which you can turn this inactive protein that is within the blood and is made by the liver, namely fibrinogen, into uh, this active, um, well, this active monomer, fibrin, which can be assembled into fibrin uh, strands. And basically, you are making a meshwork of uh, fibrin strands, which are going to help 
to uh, seal this hole in the blood vessel, basically. Um, they're not the only thing that does that. As I said, we haven't discussed hemostasis fully yet. Coagulation does not mean the forming of a blood clot. Coagulation, I just want to reiterate this again, coagulation means this conversion of fibrinogen into fibrin. This is what coagulation means. It does not mean forming a blood clot. Yes, coagulation is a very important part of forming a blood clot or forming a hemostatic plug, which is the scientific name for a blood clot, um, but it's not, um, it's not all of the story, basically, as far as hemostasis is concerned. Okay, so um, that's it for this video.